Welcome to Discover Christian Church. Our mission is to love God, love people, and impact the world. Here we go. Continuing in our series called Present Tense, and we're talking about things that uh, are struggles, like the tension that we face in our world today. Um, and it's really not a lot different than the tension that they faced 2,000 years ago, because life, right? <laughs> because life. Um, there was a guy who lived way far, way um, much earlier, much earlier than even the Corinthian people that we're looking at. His name was Job. Job had a lot of stuff. I mean, he had some present tense challenges for sure. He was in uh, just a lot of difficulty. A lot of things happened to him that were really, really hard. What's fascinating to me when I read the book of Job is his friends, right? His friends who come to comfort him. And uh, there are chapter after chapter or chapter, chapters of these guys <clears throat> giving all kinds of reasons and philosophies and all of this stuff. And uh, Job, fascinatingly, sits and listens. But then, in chapter 16, verse 3, Job is responding to these guys, and this is what he says. Won't you ever stop blowing hot air? Won't you ever stop blowing hot air? What makes you keep on talking? Now, I've heard this before <laughs> in my family. What help is that? Great friends, you know, they're just spewing all kinds of stuff. Oh, I put the Bible down too soon, yeah. So there's that, and then in contrast to that kind of living, that kind of just talking and talking and talking and talking, there's this. In chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this, verse 20, the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. The contrast of a lot of words and few words, but God's power. Our words are important. God knows that. Everybody knows the power of words. They're very, very important. But it's also very important to have actions that align with what we say. And we're going to look today at some things that are true for any relationship a friendship, a marriage, a parent-child relationship, any kind of relationship between neighbors, whoever it is, that's also true about our relationship with God. So before we dig into that, let's pray. Uh, God, may your word and your Holy Spirit clearly guide us. And may they change us right now because of your goodness, your faithfulness, and your power. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to do a quick quiz. We're going to ask the question, would you rather be famous or faithful? Would you rather be famous or faithful? Now, when we're talking about famous, basically what I'm saying is, if you would walk into public, many, many people would know who you were. No matter where you walked, you would be that kind of level, okay? So that's the famous we will use for our definition. Faithful is basically just this. It's doing the right thing in public but also in private, okay? So, want to be famous, faithful, both, or neither? So, let's start our quiz, okay? First thing, not famous and 
not faithful. All right. You're pretty much unknown, but you're a jerk. Okay? <laughs> this is you. <laughs> you're completely unfaithful. You, you can't be trusted. Whatever you say is not legit. Like, people don't, they're like, uh, that person. Like, oh, wow. So, probably not that one. What about this? I want to be famous and not faithful and unfaithful. Wow. I don't know if that's better or worse. I mean, being known for being a jerk, right? (laughs) You're famous and not faithful. Probably not that one either. What about this one? You're famous and you're faithful. Like people know wherever you go, people recognize that you're a faithful person. And there's also this possibility. Like people really don't know who you are. But those who do know that you're faithful. Which one would you choose? Going back to the first part of chapter 4, as Paul is speaking, he's talking again to a church that is divided for a lot of reasons. But one of the things that's happening is some of the people are saying, oh, I, I want to follow Paul. No, I want to follow Apollos. There's this division about these famous guys in their church. And it's frustrating to Paul. It's frustrating to Apollos. It's frustrating to God. And this is what Paul says, starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. So look at Apollos as, and me as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now, a person who is in charge as a manager must be faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. For he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. You can get a lot out of that text. But I think one of the things we can get out of is this. Just be faithful. I think that God is not incredibly concerned about how famous we are. I do think God is incredibly concerned about how faithful we are. And my guess is if you ask the people around you, they would say the exact same thing. People don't care how famous you are when you are in a relationship with them. But they sure do care how faithful you are. So let's look at a few characteristics that Paul mentions here as he's writing to the church in Corinth. And there are some, th- some words that he uses, some phrases that he uses that can help us not only in understanding our relationship with people, how to be good friends and other relationships, but what's really important in our relationship with God as well. So the first word that he uses is servant. Servant. Paul says, Apollos and I are not competing for followers. We're trying to create followers for Jesus, not for us. Paul and Apollos are saying, it's not about me. It's about God. It's about Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about the Father. And I think that's a pretty good thing to have in a relationship with someone as well, right? So not only in our relationship with God, should it be about God, but in our relationship with people, it's so good to say, it's not about me, it's about you. You know this is true when, when you think about friendships or people. How many of us love to be around people who are all about themselves and it's all for their glory? You're just like, I can't wait to hang out with that person. Or 
the person who says, how are you doing? And stops to listen to your answer. Someone said, be the friend you want to have. I think that's good. Be the friend you wish people were to you. It's kind of like what Jesus said, do to other people what you want them to do to you. The golden rule, right? From his most famous message called the Sermon on the Mount, typically. So be humble, be a servant in your relationship with people and in your relationship with God. He also says you need to be a faithful manager. A manager. Now, true friendship, like authentic friendship, is not based on what house you live in or what car you drive or what clothes you wear or what phone you have. Relationships are based on something much more significant than that. And at the end of your life, in the same way, God is not going to say, all right, so where did you live? What car did you drive? Did you have the latest phone? No. And and there's nothing wrong with having a car and a phone and clothes. All of those things are necessary. In fact, they can be beneficial. But they should never take possession of us, right? They should be possessions, but they should not possess us. And we should also be very faithful in the way that we manage those things. So God has given us so many blessings. How are we taking care of them? That's what a manager is. This, this is stuff that we recognize is ultimately not ours anyway. And we might think, well, I worked really hard for it. Well, who gave you the ability to work really hard? Right? It all comes back to what God has given us. And so whatever you have, take care of it well. The biblical word for this is stewardship, and that's what a manager is. It's a steward. It's someone who takes care of something that belongs to someone else. And ultimately, we recognize everything we have is from God, and so we take care of it. And that's everything. That's our physical stuff. So we take care of a phone if we have it. We don't just throw it around, although we do leave it around, right? I do that all the time. We we also take care financially of what God has entrusted to us. We believe that the church should be the the center of biblical wisdom. This This is where we should find the principles that God wants us to have for our lives. And we have some, uh, some courses and some classes and some people who can come alongside and help you if you're struggling financially. We really want people to, to be able to, to walk wisely so that we are not in this place of slavery to money, which so many people are in. So we need to steward that and manage our money well. We need to manage our relationships well. God has entrusted us with people in our sphere. How are we investing in those relationships? As much as we might talk about investing financially, it's so much more important to invest well relationally. And of course, most important, even above our relationships with each other, though those are really important, is our relationship with God. How are we investing in that relationship? How are we managing what God has given us, the truth that he has shared with us, the hope that we have? So we need to be servant-oriented and take care of things. And again, if I'm in a relationship with somebody, I'm going to do what's best for them, right? I'm going to care for them. I'm going to care for their emotions. I'm going to care for their finances. I'm going to care for their life. I'm going to help them manage as well. He also says we shouldn't judge too quickly. Man, guilty, guilty, guilty. When we were in Costa Rica doing language school, um, the very first day we were in orientation, and there was this guy that I was like, oh my goodness, Lord, please do not let me be in class with that guy. Class assignments were made, and of course, we were in class together. 
he was just like loud and had a question every four seconds. And I was just like, oh, this guy's going to drive me crazy. And uh, man, I love that guy. We did life group together, Teresa and I, and him and his wife and some other couples and all of our kids. Man, I, I really judged him quickly and poorly. And I'm grateful that God allowed me to get past myself and enjoy that relationship that still goes to this day. I think sometimes, you know, you've heard the phrase, you walk in someone's shoes, and we've talked about the idea that you really, you can't really do that. You can, you can do another thing, though, that's helpful. So I can't walk in your shoes, but here's what I can do. I can walk right beside you each step that you take. I can walk with you. I can learn what it's like for you. And rather than judging someone and being divisive and put your category in here, we know there are all kinds of ways that people don't listen to anyone except the ones in their own echo chamber. It's good for us not to judge too quickly, but instead to walk with people. But another thing that's going on here is he's he's saying, don't judge the outcomes of things. Like you may think this is leading towards that. But maybe it's not. Don't judge people. Don't judge outcomes. Don't judge where something is headed based on what you see today. Because God may be doing something that you don't get to see. Romans 8.28 says that God is working everything, all things together, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So sometimes we say, well, that's going to be a tragedy. I can't believe that's happening. And maybe it will. But is it more important for us to be in that situation, to pray about it, to see what God might be teaching us in this situation, to see how we can be involved in this situation. And if it is going toward a bad conclusion, then maybe God's asking us to be a part of the solution. But maybe we just need to be patient and see what God might do in that that's going to do something far beyond what we ever imagined. Don't judge people too quickly. Don't judge outcomes too quickly. And he says, wait till Jesus comes back. He wrote that like 2,000 years ago, still true today. He also says, I I know I serve with a clear conscience, but I also know that I might not be exactly right on everything. He said, God's the one who will decide. That's a pretty good way to live, I think, in relationships with people, in our own lives, to, to have you know, what's called clean living, right? So you can think of, this, think of this in all kinds of ways, like physically, like eat well, take care of your body, exercise, right? Do things that at the end of the day, you're not going to go, wow, I made some really stupid choices today. You can do that with your food, but you can do that with your relationships. Man, I let something come in to that relationship that shouldn't have come into that relationship. Or I didn't do anything to exercise that relationship. I didn't even think about it today. But again, most importantly, in our relationship with God, how are we doing with that? Are we able to stand before God at the beginning of the day and the end of the day and say, God, I know I wasn't perfect today. But I stand before you with a clean conscience. And I trust that my motives were pure. That I tried to allow only good things to come into this relationship that I have with you. There's a little bit of a frightening thing, though, that happens as he's talking about this. I don't know if you caught it, but in verse 5... It says, don't make judgments. And it says, God will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. What? (laughs) I'm not super excited about that verse. I mean, I'm just telling you it's super honest, okay? 
I don't know, and I especially don't want this to be public stuff, right? I mean, it's one thing if God knows it is a totally different thing if everybody else. When he brings it to light, where is he bringing this to light? We have these questions. And, and this makes me think of these three omnis that you maybe have heard, that God has these three words that begin with the word, or the, the words, or the phrase, omni. God is omniscient. Okay, he's omniscient. God knows everything. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. God is omnipresent. That means God is everywhere all the time. In fact, God exists outside of time and space. Wow. God is holy. God is awesome. God is incomparable. God is worthy of our worship. And God sees everything, including our motives. That could be frightening. And that is all true. We need to remember that the the decisions that we make, they have consequences to them. Some of those are physical consequences. Some are relational. Some are emotional. Some are financial. Some are spiritual. But the verse doesn't end there. The idea does not end there. That's all true, and yet, God is good. God is so good to us. God, it says, will give to each one whatever praise is due. Wait a minute. God's going to know my motives and, and see everything that I do, and then God is going to give praise to me? Yes, he is. Because this is the heart of the Father who loves us. There's some good evidence for this in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a very good, very interesting, very challenging book for us to to read through. And Hebrews chapter 11 is probably the most famous chapter in the book of Hebrews. Sometimes it's called the Faith Hall of Fame. And it lists a whole bunch of people who were faithful to God. They had faith in in the Lord. And yet, it does not say that any of them were perfect. No one is perfect. In fact, what it kind of does, it, it actually just points to something that they did where they were faithful. But again, none of these people happen to be perfect. And so what I want to do, just really, really briefly, look at four people, and I want to tell you something that's not in Hebrews 11 about them, and then see what God says about them in Hebrews 11. So something about their life that was not perfect. In fact, far from it. So let's start with Abraham. The biggest part of the chapter is devoted to Abraham. One of the things Abraham did that was pretty rotten was he said that his wife, Sarah, was his sister. Now, the reason he said that was because he was going into new territory. And horribly, the way that it worked back then was if this couple came in and they were like, I think I'll have her as my wife, they would kill the guy. That's just what they did. So he says, here, I'm going to say that you're my sister. So what would have happened to Abraham didn't happen. But guess what? What would have happened to Sarah was still going to happen. He was looking out for number one, being a little bit selfish. Fortunately, God intervened, and nothing happened bad to Sarah. In fact, some good things happened to both Abraham and Sarah because of God's faithfulness. But that's one of the things Abraham did, just a little bit selfish, right? But God says this. God God lifts up this man and says... It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave his home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God had promised to him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. So 
yeah, Abraham was flawed, but he was faithful. He was faithful to God. What about Jacob? His name actually means deceiver. He, he deceived his father and stole his brother's inheritance. Man, he, he's just a flawed human being. And yet, it says in verse 21, it was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. He was faithful to God, even though he had some messed up stuff in his life too. Moses killed an Egyptian man because he was beating a Jewish man. Might have had a little bit of a hot temper. I mean, he murdered somebody. And then he tried to cover it up. But it says here, verse 27, it was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eye on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover. It was because of his faithfulness to God, even though he wasn't perfect, that the Jewish people experienced Passover that is still celebrated to this day and that they were able to leave Egypt, no longer as slaves. Hot-tempered, but he was still faithful, and God was especially faithful in his life too, right? There's a lady named Rahab. She was a prostitute. I don't think we need to expound on that. I mean, we understand. But what's it say in verse 31? Is by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. She had her faults, but she was faithful to God and to God's people. Paul, who wrote this letter to the Corinthian people, he, at earliest points in his life, as an adult, he said, I don't even believe in this Jesus thing. In fact, I'm going to try to stomp it out. I'm going to try to kill the Christians, have them arrested and beaten and persecuted. Yeah, he was not exactly perfect in the eyes of God, was he? But Jesus got a hold of his life and changed him, and Paul was incredibly faithful to Jesus even to the, to the point which he died. See, the point is this. That God will meet us where we are. And God will bring his, his word and his Holy Spirit and other people who follow Jesus into our lives and will help us take another step towards Jesus, another step in our faith, another step in our faithfulness. Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. We just need to be faithful. And again, faithful does not mean perfect. Perfect. Romans 3.23 says that every single person who has ever lived has sinned. They fall short of this perfect standard that God has. And that's why Jesus came. To, to fill in that gap between our, our honest attempts at being perfect and the true perfection we need to have. That's why Jesus came. Here's the problem, though. When we recognize that Jesus will fill in the gap, the danger is that we go, awesome. <laughs> that is so cool. So basically, I can do whatever I want, and Jesus will fill in the gap. He will, he will cover whatever I mess up. Paul, again, writing to a different group of people in, in Rome, says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we were joined with him in death? So we died and were buried with uh, Christ in baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we now may live new lives. We can't just say, Ah, I can do what I want. I can be selfish and God will forgive me. Or I can do what I want and this person will forgive me. They have to. Or you know a person that is very forgiving and you take advantage of them. No, that's not the way to live. The way to live is to pursue God's heart and to pursue the good of others. And Jesus summarized it really well. He just said, would you just love God 
and love people. Just be faithful. In his book, Holy Sweat, Tim Hansel relates the remarkable story of Clarence and Florence Jordan. Clarence had two PhDs, one in agriculture and one in biblical languages. And in 1942, they decided they were going to start a farm to help poor people in rural Georgia. And color of skin to them was irrelevant, and that was an issue in rural Georgia. Georgia in 1942. The local people did not like the fact that, that Clarence and Florence wanted to help anyone. And they did all kinds of things to try and stop them. But this Koinonia farm, Koinonia means fellowship, this farm that they started, which by the way still exists to this day, this farm that they started was there to help, to help anyone who needed it. And so it kind of came to a point in 1954, the KKK came to the farm. And they brought fire, and they brought guns, and they brought hate. They burned every building except the farmhouse where they lived, and that building they riddled with bullets. The next day, a reporter came, in his words, to to do a story on the tragedy that had happened But the reality is, the night before he had been there, hiding behind a sheet himself. And the reporter kept prodding Clarence, and Clarence just kept working. The reporter was getting frustrated and trying to get him to answer questions, and Clarence just kept working. And finally, the reporter was so frustrated, he said, listen, you have two PhDs, and you've been working on this farm for 14 years, and there's nothing left. Just how successful do you think you've been? And Clarence stopped hoeing and planting. He turned to the reporter, and he said, about as successful as the cross. Sir, I don't think you understand us. What we are about is not success, but faithfulness. We're staying. Good day. I think that's what God is asking of us. God is not so concerned about our, fa- our, our success as God is concerned about our faithfulness, just like the people around us want us to be faithful. And so I think the challenge for me, maybe for you, is this, what's one area of your life that you know you need to be more faithful? And right now, just just ask God to help you in that. And maybe talk to someone about it and say, this is something I'm struggling with. Would you help me with this? We want to be faithful, and our best example of that is, of course, God, because above all, God is faithful. And God shows that to us in so many ways. Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 21, says, I still dare to hope when I remember this the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Would you pray with me? God, would you just help us to be faithful? And we look to you as our example, and um, we give you thanks. Continue to do your faithful work in and through our lives, individually and as a family of believers. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.